put the nail in this coffin real tight. God hates a coward. God hates a coward. 21 and 8 says, but the cowardly and the unbelievers, murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which is the second death. God wrote that I didn't. Who leads the list of that ragtag mob? The cowardly. Look at your spiritual forefathers in the faith. Moses, with a shepherd's staff, invades the royal court of Pharaoh. Pharaoh, who's considered God on earth, who has the most mighty army that any nation ever assembled together. And he looked him in the face and said, let my people go. He was not afraid. Look at David, the shepherd boy, bringing a sling. And David, and, da and Goliath is coming against him. And David looks at him and said, You come to me with a sword and spear, but I am coming to you in the name of the Lord. You've got clean Roy here coming in next seven head rate. You're not going to get off. Jesus, uh, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying. 500 Roman soldiers come from the Antonian fortress to arrest one Jewish rabbi praying in the garden. Think about that. 500 battle-ready Roman soldiers to arrest one Jewish rabbi praying with 12 sleeping disciples. They said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. And they fell on the ground like dead men. Jesus was no coward. I want to tell you something. Jesus lost his life in Calvary, but he didn't lose the fight. God will give you only what you're willing to fight for. Satan attacks you because you're God's child and he hates God's property. Satan attacks you because you're the light of the world and he's the prince of darkness. Satan attacks you because you're the truth and he's the father of lies. Satan attacks you because you're a soldier of the cross. You're anointed. You have the word of God. You have covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can take the sword of the truth of God and attack the gates of hell. You're a threat to him. Whenever you roll over in bed, every devil in Bear County gets a migraine headache. That's why he hates you. And for those of you who name the name of Christ, stop allowing Satan and his demonic goons to, to destroy your marriage. Put on the whole armor of God and fight back. Quit allowing him to attack your health. The Bible says by his stripes we are healed. Quit allowing him to attack your finances. The Bible says God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He will make him give it back to you sevenfold. Stop allowing the devil to rob you of your peace because Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Stop allowing Satan to rob you of your joy. In his presence is the fullness of joy. Do you want it? Then fight for it. Do you want it? Then fight for it. Put on the whole armor of God and stand beside me and take the word of the holiness of the Father. Fight the good fight of faith. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. We who carry this book have so taken from Jesus Christ his nature. We have forgotten who he is. He is the son of God who looked at his crowd one day and said, you are of your father the devil. That's not very commonly preached in the church of America today. The fact is that God will give you what you're willing to fight for. In this war, you will demonstrate courage or cowardice. Some of you are courageous soldiers of the cross. And some of you are cowardly to the core. You don't deserve the name of following Jesus Christ. Now here's what else you must do in the summer. Like a father, you must look out for your enemies. And believe me, we're going to have some. But remember, like a father who would guard carefully his family, I'm asking you to stand guard I'm asking you to stand at the door. I'm asking you, whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Whatever pushes against you, push it back. Whatever wants to overwhelm you like a father, stand up, take control, and do battle with your enemies wherever you find them. Be strong in the Lord. Say it with me. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. When you eat this meat for men and milk for children, you'll be strong in the Lord. When you watch 40 hours of television, you couldn't give your witness in the first church of any church in America. This is God's fight. It's not yours. 
It's God's victory, it's not yours. It's God's glory, it's not yours. It's God's kingdom, it's not yours. It's God's strength, it's not yours. Put on the whole armor of God and fight and fight to win because the victory is ours through Christ the Lord. Give him praise in the house of God. What's the point I'm making here? The point is you can never exhaust God's resources. You can never exhaust God's resources because he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. You can see his mighty power, but when he gets through, he's not exhausted. He has much more strength ready to give you from day unto day. He can defeat any giant that's before you. He can produce streams in the desert. He can produce manna that will fall from the sky. He can send cloven tongues of fire in the upper room. He can walk on the water in the Sea of Galilee and sound you, the thing that you think is about to destroy you, he can use it for a sidewalk to save you when you grow weary. He can make you to run like Elijah 40 miles before the chariot. When you grow faint, he can give you strength. He can send you power that you can't begin to touch. You cannot exalt God's power if he prays in the house of God. He can walk into the tomb of Lazarus and say, Lazarus, come forth! Why does he call Lazarus by name? Because if he didn't call him by name, he has so much strength, every dead man on planet Earth would have gotten up. That's why. Our God is an awesome God. He's full of grace and truth. He's the Almighty. El Shaddai, the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave. He's the conqueror of sickness and death. He's the conqueror of powers and principalities. He's the conqueror from Calvary. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Lord of glory. And he's coming soon with power and great glory, giving praise in the house of God. Now here's what else you must do in the summer. Like a father, you must look out for your enemies. Now here's one more. We must also deal with the enemies within ourselves. Yes, we've got enemies on the outside, but some of the enemies are not way off in some distant country. Some of the enemies are a lot closer than that. They are within. And I want to give you a list of some of the things to watch out for when you get back home called enemies within your Self. Here's the first one. Indifference. Whatever you do, practice not being casual. You've got to shake off sometimes the lethargy. That would say, oh well, maybe it's not going to work for me. Or I'll just go along and see what happens. I'm asking you, whatever you do, the intensity that you've gathered up here, during this extravaganza, I want you to take this same intensity home with you. <coughs> Don't be All right, so we're going to try this again. I'm going to click the camcorder on and uh, so we can get the video on YouTube. Um, my media help isn't feeling well, so it's all on me. I apologize to lose the last feed and you know after I sort of reflected on it maybe the Lord didn't want me to present the message that he gave me in that way so God's a lot smarter than I am um, a lot of my prayers start off with God you know my history of making bad decisions I really need your help in making this one so you know it's good to be real with the Lord it's good to uh, our prayers and supplications to pour our complaints out to God he's the only one that can do anything I was like, listening to a message yesterday and it was talking about the parable of the lady and the unjust judge you know she received justice because she just would not give up you know it's a good example of a real man a real man never gives up on doing the right thing well we want to talk this morning you know a couple quick announcements um, um we got the revival coming up from the 13th to the 17th um, I'm not sure how we're going to handle that. Hopefully, we'll be at the location on the 16th for uh, uh, Samantha Delgado and on that Sunday morning for Christopher Blevins. Uh, if we're not open back up then, we're probably going to postpone uh, the revival. I just, um, I know God wants us to have this revival. It's been on my heart, but the timing is, uh, is really based on when we're allowed to get back and be in corporal worship together. 
Uh, she's got a lot of prayer requests. We mentioned them yesterday. Just continue to remember those people. Remember Jennifer Hopps and her family, Carolyn Cooper. Remember the Wyatts. We got lots to pray about. Remember my mom. You know, let's just keep them uh, before the Lord. And we got um, uh, some of our people that have uh, that are struggling really, really hard. Some Short Creek family that's struggling really, really hard. So, you know, it, 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 intercessory prayer is is real. Man, you can get on your knee. God puts somebody on your heart. Sometimes it's not about calling them. Sometimes it is and checking them, letting them know. But a lot of times it's about prayer. It's about engaging in spiritual warfare. When we read Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the last thing it talks about is prayer. We go through those pieces of armor, but we leave out the importance of the prayer. You know, the, the three pillars, prayer, the word, and worship. And we worship on their behalf. We pray on their behalf. We read on their behalf. We engage in the spiritual realm with the, the forces that are coming against them, and we pray. You know, you read uh, 1 John 5, 15, and 16. You see a good example of that, and, and we see intercessory prayers in Jude 20 and uh, Romans 8, 25, 26, and 27. We see how important intercessory prayer is. So please <clears throat> pray for them. You know, I've been a... Uh, um, the majority of my life, um, I have been a sorry excuse for a man. Uh, according to the world's eyes, uh, I provided. I provided well for my family before I went to prison. Uh, we had a nice house. We had nice cars. We had private schools. But man, I was a pitiful, a pitiful excuse for a man. Uh, I had let my health go. Uh, I wasn't... Um, you know, one of the reasons, I'm just going to be really transparent. You know how I am. I'm going to be really, really transparent. One of the reasons I work out so hard and take care of myself is because I realized that in my first marriage, I'd let myself go to the point that I was very unattractive. And um, I think it's important that we keep ourselves up for our spouses. I know I want, I want Marilyn to be proud of, of my physical appearance. And people may say I'm wrong for that. I, I don't really know. Um, I know I feel better when I exercise, and, and I know I like how she looks at me, um, and maybe that's pride, maybe it's some, but, you know, the bottom line is, is before the prison, before the, the event that crushed me, my life was lived by what felt good, what tasted good, what felt good, what looked good, what sounded good, what smelled good, but what felt good. I lived my life based on these five senses. I was a very self-centered, prideful, um, just a pitiful excuse of a man. My family did not come first. My job come first. My career come first. Uh, God was, he, I acknowledged him and I always testified of his love for me and the miracles in his family. But man, he, he, he was way down the list. He was not first in my life. And and, but God loved me enough to shake things up, loved me enough to organize or orchestrate the feds coming to my house in Hickory Ridge and arresting me and sending me to prison to figure out what being a real man is. And this is what this is about. Day 40 men's group is all about brothers uh, helping brothers, brothers serving brothers, about a collective of men that sow into each other and encourage them and lift them up. But we have a lot of misconception on what a real man is. You know, I've made the statement several times that, um, um, you know, the guys that we've lost, men like Gary Wayne Parr and, and my dad, we've lost a level of toughness that we don't see much today. I remember right there at the end of my dad's life and, having one or two strokes a week and I still working on the house and him barely being able to walk and having all that metal in his neck that's been there and the screws pushing out and him in intense pain, but him helping me unload that rough cut lumber. And man, I'm wore out and I can't even imagine how he feels. He's 140 pounds and or 160 pounds at the time and losing weight and he's really sick, but he just kept pressing himself because he felt in his heart that this was it. He, we talked about it all the time. We talked about how he knew that he was at the end of his life and that how he had to get that closet built for my mom. He was so focused 
Oh, she needs a closet because she needs it. And we worked and worked and worked. It was such an honor. But when I looked at that, I said, how many people, how many men do we have today that live up to that level? You know, uh, I was talking to a young man the other day and, and he was um, talking about how many different women his dad slept with. You know, and that's his idea of what a real man is. A real man sleeps with a bunch of different women. And man, that's the farthest from the truth. Though, though when you do that and live that kind of lifestyle, you're creating a spiritual bond with a person. And man, it just creates havoc and, and uh, discord. And, and it says those that sow to the flesh reap corruption. It, it literally reaps corruption on your life. We also look at a real man. What kind of work do you do? I mean, are you, you a welder, boiler maker, pipe fitter? We we look at people's uh, profession as being more important than their calling. That's what the world does. Uh, how many fights have you been in? I know when I was younger, um, I had a chip on my shoulder. I, I was uh, and I did the the inventory and I backed it up from being hurt as a child and and feeling helpless, feeling helpless to help my little brother out of a situation. And, and the pressure that that had on me, I, I overcompensated and I become defiant and mean, and I was never going to be weak again. Let me tell you, that's still something I struggle with today. You know, I never want to feel weak and helpless again, but the truth is, is man, I've got to be weak and helpless in the arms of a loving God in order to be the man that God called me to be. Um, we judge a man by how much you bench, how much you squat. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a fitness guy. I work out. I enjoy it. It, it. it gives me a release. That's my me time. And there's times that Marilyn and I need to gather watching some crazy, clean, but crazy Netflix show that where we can decompress and we can relax. And then there's times that I need. I need to be able to work out and put on that worship music. But sometimes we... Look at a man and how's he built and how big is his shoulders, how big of his biceps. Man, that's very little to do with what a real man is. How much money you make, you know, and, and I've been so guilty of this, just looking at my life and being proud because I've had those months where I've made all that money in those years and, and God's blessed me financially and just being proud of that. You know, man, that is so wrong and so backwards and that that that's what makes me a punk. That's what makes me less of a man. That's what, that's not what real manhood is. They, it has nothing to do with how much money you make or your education or, you know, one of the things that, that I used to do when I would hire salespeople, I'd say, let me see a picture of your wife. And if they had a pretty wife, you know, I'd always relate that their ability to sell, but listen, how pretty your wife is, how pretty your girlfriend is, the physical appearance of them man really has nothing to do with what kind of man you are. A real man is going to pick a wife based on her characteristics. A real man is going to pick a wife based on who her mother is. Listen, are you hearing, are you listening to me? You know, if you're in a relationship, a lot of times you can tell a lot about a woman by how her mother is. And you look at that, and I'm not saying that they definitely got to be just like their mom, but a lot of times you can really, really pick up on the type of person by their parent. Same thing with the dad. Um, what kind of truck, what kind of boat, etc. And Mark, I will send you the link to that God. It's a line of Judy, line of Judah. God hates a coward. I've listened to that all the time. That oh uh, man, that's an awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, I'll uh, uh, send that to you in a little bit. Okay, so but. I was reading this, uh, All Pro Dad sent me this ebook, and it and it's, uh, talks about five different types of men, and I was reading this, and man, it just really spoke to me, and as I looked at it, I could see periods of my life, and even periods of my day where I fell into these categories of five different types of men. The first type it talks about is the whiner. Listen to this. This is the man who gets up most mornings and chooses to be paralyzed by his past. He finds it difficult to move forward in life because he's constantly looking backwards. He chooses to blame his present struggles on his past problems. The result is, is that he becomes what I call a why baby. He asks questions like, why did that happen to me? Why didn't that happen to me? Why him 
and why not me? You know, and I see I got caught up in that so bad. You know, I, I, I've looked at things. I've looked at other people's success, and I've envied them. And I never once realized until I got to hanging around some guys that were extremely wealthy and and they had gained their wealth illegally, and, and they were always looking over their shoulder. They was always worried. They're always concerned. And I said, man, I would rather have a, a, a peaceful day than all that money in the world because what good is that money? Do you re yeah, yeah, we get excited when I, when I buy things, when I buy me a new pair of shoes or a new shirt. Yeah, that, that satisfies and makes me happy for a minute, but I don't need temporary happiness. I need permanent joy. So in, but if I'm living in why, 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 and there's a lot of things I can say, I, I can ask, why did this have to happen? Why did my dad have to die? Why was my little brother murdered? Why did my first marriage end in a mess? Why are my kids doing this? Why? And I just get caught up so much in the why, I just get paralyzed. And we can't do that. We got to move past it. So why did it happen to me? Why didn't it happen to me? So we just look at other people and we begin to envy where God has them in their life. And let me tell you, everything may look good on their Facebook post. Everything may look good on Instagram, but you need to go home with that person before you realize what kind of life they really got. You need to hang out with them for a little while before you realize if you really want their life or not. Philippians 3, 13 through 15 says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reach forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. Let us therefore, as many as perfect, have this attitude. And if any of you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. So forgetting those things which are behind and pressing in, when we say forgetting, we know that they exist and we keep, we're mindful of them. The only reason we do is for two reasons. So we don't repeat it and it, so we don't repeat it and we are a testimony of the life that God has given us through Christ. Um, there's a lot of things that, that, that haunt me from my past. There's a lot of struggles with the decisions that I've made. When, and, 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 but I have to determine if I get stuck in that, I'm going to repeat it. I say this all the time. It's only a mistake if you do it twice. If you do something wrong and learn from it, it's not a mistake. It's a lesson. But if you keep repeating, repeating it, man, that's just not smart. You got to you got to let go of it. You got to ask God to help you. You got to humble yourself. You got to submit yourself to God. That's what real men do. They submit. They turn out in, in this world. We're told to never surrender, but in the kingdom of God, we're told to surrender in the world. We're told in order to, to gain victory, we got to fight to get the W in the category to get the W to win at all cost. But in the kingdom of God, we're told that victory is made through submission. It's us prideful men. We don't want to turn our life over to God. We don't want people to see us cry. They don't want to, they don't want to see us in the altar pouring our heart out to God. We're rigid and we hold on and we don't want to be emotional. I had a young man tell me one time, he said, um, he called me dad and, and uh, he had lost somebody that he loved and he was really upset. And I said, why didn't you talk to him? He said, I just didn't want you to see me cry. I didn't want you to think that I wasn't a man. And I'm not. Real man cry, brother. Real man cry, son. Real man pour their hearts out to God. That's what real men do. So we don't be a whiner. We don't complain about the past. And I know uh, uh, I'm a pastor. I've been married three times. I've been to prison. Um, it's just uh, my past is an issue for a lot of people. And that's okay. I can't control their attitudes. I can't control their perceptions. There's some churches that would never have me come speak. There's some people that think my ministry is just all about addiction and that's all that it's good for. You know, there's some people that, that put me in a, in a shoebox in a category and, and just try to isolate me there. But God had something different. You know, I can't live my life based on their misperception of what God has called me to. So they 
perceive that I'm supposed to live this way or they perceive that I can't have a relationship with God. They perceive that I can't have an effective ministry. Am I going to live on their perception? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I can't live on their perception. So I got to step out of the wise. I got to step out of the wise. And then the next, <clears throat> so we got the whiner. The next guy is the warrior. This is a man who is not paralyzed by his past. <clears throat> so he, he's let go of the past but he's fearful of the future because he's constantly looking ahead. He's afraid to move forward, but unlike the whiner, the warrior doesn't ask why because he's too busy asking himself what if. Man, there's two days that you should never, never, never spend a lot of time thinking about. That's yesterday and tomorrow. God, when he provided for the children of Israel in the desert, in the wilderness, he provided enough bread for that day. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. So he asks, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this doesn't happen? So he lives in the what else, and he ends up being paralyzed by worry. He doesn't make any move at all because he's so afraid to move, he doesn't know the end result. But we do know the end result. For I know that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord, they're called according to his purpose. And what we have to realize is that I'm walking in God's purpose, God's calling for my life, that all things are going to work together for my good. Now, I want you to understand this. If your career is taking precedence over your calling, and you're, every one of you are called. I, I know preachers today that are more concerned. I mean, God anointed, God called preachers that are more concerned about their career than they are their calling. And when we do that, what happens? We get paralyzed. We get paralyzed. We get worried. So we, if we are walking in the purpose of God, we realize that these things, man, they're going to work out. They're going to work out for our good. <clears throat> And to be materially minded causes this problem. When we get so worried about living in this house or buying this truck or getting this job or working this overtime, when we get so consumed with stuff like that, that's addressed in Matthew 6, 24 and 25. It says, how could you worship two gods at the same time? You will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot worship the true God while being enslaved to the God of money. This is why I tell you to never be worried about your life for all that you need will be provided such as food, water, clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to your life than a meal? Isn't your body more than clothing? So we get so consumed in the natural that we cannot walk in freedom in the spiritual. Every, every issue that we have has a spiritual root, but we see the natural and the spiritual going back and forth. So if I'm walking naturally or carnally, I'm reaping corruption upon myself. If I'm more concerned about this life, then if I'm more concerned about the natural than I am the spiritual, man, I'm walking in bondage and I'm going to be consumed as a warrior and in asking myself the questions, the what ifs. The next guy, so we got the whiner, we got the warrior. The next guy is the waiter. This is a man who is indecisive in the present. He isn't satisfied where he is and he wants things to change, but he isn't willing to make any changes. I mean, I mean I've been there so many times. I, I wanted to uh, lose weight, and I, I wanted to get into shape. I wanted to, to, to do things. I wanted to go on a fast. I, 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 I wanted to make my marriage better. I wanted to have a better relationship with my kids. I wanted to be more involved in their schoolwork, but I just get stuck. Why? He's waiting for a miracle or act of God to change his circumstances or situation. He expects to be rescued and reap the rewards with little or no effort on his part. Man, I like what OTD Jake said. He said, there's a guy praying for a table. He's seeking God. He's pouring his heart out to God. God, give me a table. And finally, God told him one day, he said, hey, I make trees, not tables. Go get you a hammer 
and a saw and some nails and build you a table. Man, we've got to do our part. We've got to do our part. The idea that we just surrender to God and God does all the work isn't right. I'm going to be preaching on that Sunday morning. We are the love of God. We, we are the priest of our home. Our children understand God by their relationships with us. Our wives understand Jesus, the, 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 we're the bride of Christ. He understands our relationship with Jesus through the relationship with us. We're mutually submissive to God. We, 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 just, we just get it backwards sometimes. You know, there's times that a guy like this wants his marriage to improve, but he's not willing to go to counseling. He wants to stop watching pornography, but he's not willing to confess. He's not willing to confess his fault one to another so that he might be healed. He's, but he's not willing to join a support group. He wants a better relationship with his children, but he won't spend time with them. He is the waiter. He's stuck in the middle. Elijah, when he walked up on the mountain and he caught the fire called down from heaven, before that, he looked at them and said, how long are you going to be stuck between two opinions? If Baal, the God of money and mammon, be God, worship him. But if God be God, worship him. If Jehovah be God, worship him. It says in James 1 and 6, it says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In Revelations, it says, God said, I wish you were either cold or hot, but this lukewarm stuff makes me want to vomit. We've got to decide. We've got to choose. We cannot be indecisive. When we see a problem, we've got to move in the will of God in order to resolve that relationship issue. Thank you, Jesus. The fourth fellow is the wounded. This is a man who lives in isolation, solitude, and suffers in silence. Man, I know so many people that are struggling. I can tell when they're struggling because they stop calling. I can tell when they're struggling because I can't get them on the phone. I can tell when they're struggling because they stop coming to church. They isolate themselves in solitude because of the pain that has been caused to them or the pain they have caused to other people. They're embarrassed. They're humiliated. Man, I was humiliated when I was arrested. I was at the top of my game. I was the, I, I, I was, I was the man in the car business. God, I, I was blessed I, it, from the world's perspective. You know, I don't... Yeah. It just and when I got arrested, I go from uh, I go, I go from hiring people. I get out of prison. I get a job at Nikki's West, and now the same people that I'm hiring, I'm picking up their dirty dishes as a bus bus boy. You know the way I made it through that is I admitted it. I said I earned this. I deserve this. I committed the crime. This is this is my doing, and I refuse to complain about it. I just picked up the dirty dishes. When I sat down in prison and ate the raw pinto beans with rocks and band-aids in them, I picked through it and I ate. When I ate the uncooked rice, I ate. When I ate the rancid ground turkey parts that smelled like puke, I ate it and I never complained. I thanked God for it because I realized that if I complained, my 30 months could turn into 30 years. <laughs> so I can't live in a wounded state. He's still hurting from his past. He feels helpless in the moment. And he feels hopeless about his future. He's stuck in the shame and guilt. And it's difficult for him to talk about it because he finds it very difficult to trust anyone a lot of times we put our trust. I remember a preacher a long time ago. I I entrusted him with some some stuff, and man, he uh, he told some people, and it got back to me. And of course, I'll never uh, hardly even talk to the guy again because I told him in confidence. And there's times that that that's going to happen, but don't let that stop you. You know, find somebody. You know, you need a good pastor. You need a good mentor. You need a good men's group, a thing you can confess one to another so that you can be healed. He's either too angry or too afraid or too ashamed to move forward. So he doubts himself, others, and even God. In Romans 8 and 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that, that which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So there's no guilt, no shame, no condemnation in the spiritual realm. We just got to let the spiritual realm invade the natural realm. We got to understand who we are in Christ. And then I'll promise you, you can walk in freedom. One of the biggest issues we have in society today is people don't have dads. 
I mean, I, I'm a spiritual dad to a lot of people, and it's such an honor and uh, such a privilege for them to call me dad or pops, you know, my uh, my son, Cedric, man, he's so close to me. I love him so much. He's coming to see me today, and I hope he's listening to this. Son, I love you, man. I'm, I'm proud of the progress you made. But man, we gotta we gotta keep plugging. We gotta keep growing. We gotta keep pop Saint Medici, man. I I got room for improvement. But we see people that they get their identity from their earthly fathers. That's where it starts. And we are to demonstrate the love of God to our children as earthly fathers. They're to understand who God is by their relationship with us. So many of them don't have their earthly fathers in their lives. And it's a shame. And that's what's wrong with society today. That was a scheme of the devil. That was a scheme of the devil. So many children raised without godly men in their lives. I mean, it's just caused a ripple effect of all kind of problems. And then we glamorize the man that sleeps with a bunch of different women. And we glamorize the man that can um, that, that can hit a three-pointer or run a touchdown. And, but we don't glamorize the guy, the, the one that, that needs to be glamorized, the ones that need to be lifted up, the ones that need to be honored as one that's willing to lay down his life for his family. We have to ask ourselves, do I want to be a warrior? That's the next one. So we see the whiner, we see the warrior, we see the waiter, and we see the wounded. And what we want to be is the warrior. Now listen to this. This is the man who does not whine about his past. He does not worry about his future. He's not waiting to be rescued from his present situation. He's not afraid of being wounded again because he's more concerned about leaving a legacy. You know, my dad left a legacy. There is uh, four generations of preachers preaching to my family, a legacy of spreading the gospel. I want to leave a legacy with my children, not a legacy of 2687601, not of my federal inmate ID number, not a legacy of uh, owning companies, not a legacy of being wealthy, not a legacy of uh, anything other than a legacy of a submitted life to God. A humble life to God. A submitted, that's the legacy we should all be trying to leave. He's willing to fight for his marriage and to do whatever it takes to make it good. All the counts and sessions. He's willing to give up the fishing trips. He's willing to give up the hunting trips. He's willing to serve his spouse and do whatever it takes to have a good marriage. He's willing to do whatever it takes to have a good family. He, he gets up on Sunday morning, he dresses them, and he takes them to church. He is more worried about his children's understanding of Jesus in the Bible than he is their understanding of algebra. Man, we spend a lot of time pouring into our kids, their education, supporting, got to get into good school, you got to get... But what happens if they don't have a relationship with God? What if they don't know who Jesus is? Then they're open to darkness and darkness comes in and that education doesn't do them any good. And he's also there for his brothers. Man, I got some brothers. I, I, I got some friends that have been there for me. I got people that uh, um, uh, checked on me every day when my dad was dying. I got people that don't even know the place they have in my heart. I got people that have been there that they know something's wrong and they text me out of the blue. They know when something's wrong. You know, and I got some people like that in my life. I, I, there's a couple that you say you're okay, but I know you're not okay. The Lord's already told me, you might as well just come talk to me. Let me help you work through this. You don't want to hold on to this. You don't want to continue in this lifestyle. You want to move. You want to move. You want to move out of the past. You want to move out of the worry. You want to move out of the wounding. You want to move out of the waiting. You want to move. You don't want to be complacent. You want to make progress. You want to be a godly man, a godly husband. I know you do. I know it's, but you, you're just such in bondage. Take step one. Step out of denial and say, hey, I can't do this on my own. Stop comparing your problems to other people's problems. Stop it. Stop it. They're, that's them. Let them do them. You do you. And doing you means turning it over. Doing you means 
you submit yourself to godly counsel. And you take the advice and you heed it and you move on it. He's more concerned about his character than his circumstances, his destiny than the detours in his life, and his legacy more than his losses. Listen to this. A warrior is a fighter, and he would rather die with a spear in his chest than a spear in his back. His motto is simply no retreat, no surrender. He does not stop pursuing the righteousness of God. <laughs> I'll seek you first the righteousness of God and all these things will be added unto you. He doesn't give in to the pressures. We surrender to God, but we don't surrender to the pressures of the ideas of what a real, of this world, what a real man is. Man, this is from my heart. I love y'all. I appreciate y'all tuning in. We'll be back uh, Sunday morning for Sunday school, 10 o'clock um, and then 11 o'clock for worship and, and, um, in the word Sunday afternoon we'll have freedom group and hopefully on the 17th we'll be back having corporate worship together y'all have a good day God bless you